Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and you find me at the wheel of something absolutely enormous. Yes, I am driving the five meter long Kia EV9, the new flagship of the Kia range available as both a six and a seven seater. This is the six seater luxury GTS line. Now, no SUVs aren't really my thing, but I'm gonna go into this with an open mind and let you know what I think of this. Whoa. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving. Can you see me past this enormous lump of Kia? Yes. I know this is a slightly unusual one for Furious Driving because I make no secret of the fact I don't really like SUVs. I think they're oversized and a bit pointless for the purposes most people have them. Sorry if you drive an SUV. However, this one is a little bit different because although this is absolutely massive, this is a kind of Range Rover, Land Rover Discovery size vehicle, sort of Land Rover Defender kind of class of thing. The packaging on this thing actually makes it an awful lot more useful than many of its rivals. This though, isn't just a seven seater. This is less but more. This is a six seater SUV. So basically the closest you're gonna to get to a luxury minibus these days, there's nothing else like it on the market. It's also electric twin motor, four wheel drive, and frankly, a little bit different. And I like different, so I'm gonna give it a chance. I'm gonna go and open-minded to this review because I don't like SUVs, but I do like different. Think different, as Steve Jobs used to say. So let's start off talking about the Kia EV9. And first of all, the thing you're looking at right now, and the thing that got most comments on Twitter when I posted a picture of this thing, the styling. Now I was gonna crack some kind of elephant in the room joke and make a, a gag about the size of this thing, but that's too easy. I'm not even gonna go there. This is a really interesting bit of styling. First of all, I'm gonna tell you, I like it. I think it's really quite interesting, but I like the original Multipla as well, and I also like the PT Cruiser, so don't judge me. However, this is one of those cars which really does look better in the metal than it does on camera. Because I've seen lots of photos and I've seen lots of comments under photos of people saying, ugh, ugly, bleh, that kind of thing. But I've shown this to a lot of people, and everyone, to a man pretty much, has walked up to it and gone, I like that, that's quite interesting. Because it is. It's really well proportioned. Now this is where styling often falls over. It doesn't matter how good your styling is at the front or the back or the middle, if everything isn't quite right for itself, then it doesn't look right. This though, it's all in proportion. Yes, it is massive. It is five meters long, just a smidge over five meters long and a smidge under two meters wide. It's basically a Nats Knacker shorter than my Ford Crown Victoria and just as wide. Kia really have been smashing it with some interesting designs lately. Whether or not you like them or not is entirely personal. However, this, I do think, has got incredible presence. It has got these stacked headlights which are tall and narrow and do emphasise the height and the width of the car. But they are individual LED elements to make up LED matrix lights which work after a fashion. They're not as good as Mercedes ones, I've got to be honest, but they're, they're pretty good. And this flows into this big, wide, flat area. It's very, very... The idea of what the future looked like back in the 1980s. And it's, I'm there for it, I love it. Simple detailing across here at the front, simple detailing here at the bottom. You do have these flaps which open at speed. It's active aero, so it, it opens and closes as it needs to. Well, bear in mind though, this is a big bluff fronted square thing, a lot of frontal area. Anything you can do to help is gonna be good. Now Kia offers this in six colours, and if you want it in this colour, and trust me you do, this is called Pacific Matte Blue, and it's exclusively available on this, the top range one, the GTS line. Now this also, as well as being an interesting semi-matte colour, it's nice to have a bright, bright colour on a car this big. It makes it look less blocky and a bit more, well, just friendly and nice. But it also contrasts very nicely with these black plastic side mouldings. But incidentally, I was doing a photo shoot on a Lancia Delta HF Integrale the other day, and I took this car along, and it was interesting to notice the 1980s boxy arches on that sports car were very, very similar to these geometric lines that are down the side of this thing. So a lot of 80s echoes in this, and maybe that's why I like it so much. Also for improved aero, these door handles do pop in and out when you need to use them. When the car locks or it's in motion, these retract into the door, they pop out again when you want to open it. And another 1980s themed item here. These doors, like on an 80s Saab 900, wrap all the way around the sill, which is an interesting little note. And the rear doors are very, very long. They're like limo length rear doors. So really easy access for the four rear passengers. 
as I say, the car is about five meters long, but its wheelbase here, 3.1 meters. So there is a quite a bit of overhang. But that 3.1 meters means there's a lot of space in the middle for people and stuff, lots of room for activities. But the only downside of a big wheelbase is it does mean the turning circle gets a little bit larger as well. So maneuvering this already very big car in a tight space can be a little bit tricky. And another little side note, it, these roof rails are standard on all models, emphasizing, as Kia say, the adventurous lifestyle that you're expected to have with this car. So if you've got this car, you've got to take up parachuting. Sorry, I don't make the rules. Okay, let's throw some numbers your way. This is the GTS line, and that means it's a twin motor all wheel drive system that creates 378 bhp, shush, and 700 newton meters of torque. That means it's got 124 mile an hour top speed and 0 to 60 in 5.3 seconds, which for something which weighs 3,190 kilograms is impressive. It's like a house flying at you. It's just ridiculous. In terms of power, it's a 99.8 kilowatt hour battery. It's a 100 kilowatt hour battery, basically, isn't it? And it supports vehicle to load as well, so you can take power back out of the car again to run stuff off it too, which is also very impressive. That battery weighs 566 kilograms, so almost as much as an original <laughs> Master MX-5, and it supports 800 volt charging. And that means if you can find an 800 volt charger, you can go from 10 to 80% of power in 24 minutes. Now this thing is built on Kia's new Electric Global Modular Platform, or eGIMP, which I'm sure is not the correct acronym, which means there's gonna be other electric cars based around this thing coming in the near future. But they've not trusted me with any of that information yet, so I don't know what they are. That bing means we've gone into a new speed limit. Honestly, it bings for so many things. It bings to tell you of speed limit changes, it there's a different bing to tell you you've crept a single mile an hour over the speed limit. The, the bings are so frequent, they basically become meaningless and they just become a background irritation. I don't know if you can turn them off. I, I really do kind of hope you can because that would make the car a lot nicer to be in because it's a lovely thing to be in. But those just little constant nagging ding, ding, dings all the time just really make me want to go and drive like a 1950s Morris. So the front trunk, the frunk or the fruit, depending on what you want to call it. There are two sizes of fruit, depending whether you've got the twin motor or the single motor rear wheel drive, the basic car. This being the all wheel drive twin motor has the smaller boot, which is not a vast space, I've got to admit. Now you've got room for your charging cable to slot in there. It's about 50 litres, which isn't a vast amount. But one thing that does confuse me very much indeed, is a little button down here. Like on all American spec cars, there's an emergency button for in case you're locked in the boot and it glows in the dark and you can find something to pull a tag or a button to release yourself. There's one in here. What, is this for your cat? I don't get it. In case you're wondering, and I'm pretty sure you probably were, Kia do actually have a name for this particular kind of styling. They call it Opposites United. And the idea is they're pushing ideas against each other and coming out with something quite exciting. And it does look really good. I can't emphasize how this has actual real presence in person that doesn't come through in a photo. From this curiously bluff front end, which flows through these big geometric shapes, long flowing roof with the rising belt line and this little rising kick up in the back here through to this big spoiler at the top of here. It does look very sporty indeed, considering it's such a big, big truck, well, truck house. It's a shed on wheels, basically. Like at the front, we've got these tall, angular, dare I say it, Volvo-esque tail lights. Somewhere a Volvo V90 is missing its tail lights. And the tailgate itself is absolutely enormous. There is a camera up here. There are cameras everywhere, in fact, to make parking the thing more easy. You can open this tailgate with the key fob, that button down there, or a button on the dashboard, power, assisted obviously now when we've got the seats up in the back configured as a six seater we've got an average hatchback size worth of, of boot space in here but that's not the whole story come and have a look seats up you've got a fair bit of space an averagely good amount of room certainly enough for everyday to day duties and a week's worth of shopping that kind of stuff you've got an area in the floor which has got your basically useless tire pump of goo you've got your locking wheel nuts and you've even got i don't know how you get this thing out but you have got a parcel shelf. So if you want to put a parcel shelf in here, hide your valuables, you can do that. It's all under a sturdy floor. We've got a standard cigarette light, a 12 volt outlet on the left, and we've got a UK 240 volt three pin plug on the right. So loads of adaptability. That's a vehicle to load, so you can actually plug things in 
if you're out and about going hiking for the day, you can plug in a kettle and make yourself a cup of tea before you go up that mountain or when you get back. But the party tricks don't end there because we have this little panel of buttons down here. So we've got second and third row buttons. I hit the third row and these will magically and electrically fold forwards and indeed fold back up again, which is kind of cool. And that gives you, well, I'm going to call it commodious. There's no other word for it. It's a big old boot just there. Lovely flat floor, so loads of space, all good in the hood. Then you've got a second button here for second row. These are not motorized, these are flippy boingy, but they go all the way through there. And then you've got about a mile and a half of space all the way to the front seat. I mean, seriously, I don't know how far this goes back, but ow. It is a very long way back here. I mean, you can lie out full. You could put yourself a mattress in here. You could go camping in that, which would be great. Uh, however, because it does have proper full-size seats in here and proper headroom and everything, this is a very high floor. So basically your, your storage height is like an estate car with its boot floor a very long way from the ground rather than a very tall SUV, which is what some people buy an SUV for, but mountain bikes and stuff in. But there you go, lots and lots of space. But the party tricks still don't end there. There's still more. It's kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Now, if there is one little Debbie Downer with these seats, it is just that you have to manually put them back. It's like it's a stone age or something here. Goodness me, it's terrible. However, as well as being foldy forward and backward, they do also, they do also whoops, slide backs and forwards so you can have more legroom in the rear the third rear if you want to, which is a nice touch. Now we're talking about the interior of this car in a slightly random order, but for starting in the middle row, just here where we are now, these seats, as well as going backwards and forwards, they have a nice arm so you have a proper captain's chair experience and you can find the little switch. Whoop, they rotate as well. Full on captain, aye aye. And not only that, and the gifts keep on giving because here in the middle row, we've got heated and cooled seats as well. It's not just the front seat passengers that get all the good toys. It's only the poor losers in the back who are missing out properly. We've got so much going on here for people sitting in the back of the car, as well as the big mid-range and tweeter speakers here. We've got storage in the doors. We've got twin cup holders here in the back. We've got this big pull-out storage bin, which has got like a, a rubberized table in the middle of it, which slides back to reveal a huge storage bin which is really handy. Hard plastic map pockets just here. And above us, we've even got a, a bank of independent for this row, heating and ventilation controls in the ceiling, as well as a pair of ceiling mounted blowers as well. Something in a private jet. Oh, I forgot to mention sun blinds as well. There's just masses and masses of space and stuff. And of course, there's still the third row to look in as well. So climbing on through to the back row, it's actually quite nice walking through here. Because it's a big, tall car, there's a fairly decent amount of headroom, and it's like walking down the aisle of a private jet. That, mi that middle row seat could move further forward to give me a bit more space in there. But here in the back, I've got a little cubby for stuff. I've got a cup holder, another cubby. I've got a USB, I've got my own speaker. And once again, we've got our own personal air vents in the ceiling. It's also got a big glass roof with twin sunroofs which you can electrically close these blinds from the front in. This is pretty impressive. And don't forget the headroom back here and legroom and footroom, because this is a third row seat. If you're thinking third row is where you stick the five-year-olds because there's no room for anything with that. I'm a fully grown adult. I'm like five foot 11. I've got space to spare above my head and I've got room for my feet. I have been less comfortable with less space on an economy flight. This is, this is really nice. Did I mention it also has reclining seats when the car's parked, you can put the seats back for a, a nap in the car park. Ah, oh, this car's got riz. Right, so now, finally, the driver's bit. And you can already hear it chinging and chiming because this thing does nothing but ching and chime at you all day long. So we'll start off talking about the ergonomics and the controls. Now, this driving position is curious because you're in a, such a big, tall car, but you feel like you're a little bit low. That does mean you're looking over the bite and parking can be a wee bit tricky, but there are cameras literally everywhere. It is festooned, I think is the word. Next up, we've got the controls. The current thing of sticking everything on a screen is something I hate beyond compare. I would not buy a car with everything on the screen. This has hit a fairly reasonable middle ground. It's a pair of 12.3 inch screens that are sort of blended together in one big thing, which also 
is nice because it's nice and long and low. It doesn't stick up too high and get in the way. The dashboard feels more integrated than otherwise it could do. And although you can go into additional depth on things like the seat here on the screen, the basics are actually on buttons as well. So your temperature choice and your fan speed it's all down here on these toggles. Your volume control for the radio is here on a dial. On the door itself, we've got real buttons. So the heated seats, heated and cooled seats are also on buttons on the door, which is fantastic, as is your heated steering wheel and your massage if you're in the driver's seat, which is rather, rather nice, actually. Looking around, we have got a decent tea shelf area. Lots of room up here for parking your cup of tea up if you're having a mug, a joe on the go. Having an active lifestyle, of course, you do need to have cups of tea and coffee at all times. We do have our opposites united design language of lines across all of things like the pedals and all the grills across the speakers. It's a 14 speaker Meridian sound system which does sound absolutely fantastic. Whether you listen to music or spoken word, it is crystal clear and it is absolutely lovely. Rather than using leather or cotton, they've gone for loads of recycled materials. So everything is basically a recycled something. And these fabrics, soft touch fabrics everywhere are a really nice, interesting take on a premium vehicle because it does look and feel really nice. And this uh, little fabric area here is lifted slightly off the back of the dashboard and there's a glowing blue light, which you can change the color of, hidden behind there. Also, it turns red if you're doing something the car really doesn't like. I do rather like these air vents which curve around in from the edge as well. In the centre of the car, there's not a lot because so much is on the screen, there aren't really very many buttons. There are six buttons which are hidden in the centre, you just see the light up words. I'll, I'll be honest though, I actually didn't see them at first because the light was on them from the sun and it made them hard to see. But once you know they're there, they're easy to see. That means everything is very, very clear and open and uncluttered. And you have this big open area in the centre of the car as well. You've got a pair of USBs which you can change the function of with the button in the centre and you do have a hidden 12 volt cigarette lighter type socket down there. You've also got a big storage cubby down there. You've got twin cup holders up here in the top with this thing that the Kia do quite a lot where you have, it goes from a big open area to push the button and the magic rotating cup holders appear out of nowhere. One is bigger than the other and I do find that even though with a fairly decent sized cup that does rattle around quite a bit in there. Now hidden just here under this armrest which does lift up as well giving you even more storage a little area which is a phone charging pad, you just slide your phone in there and also it links into the phone as well so you get your CarPlay or whatever working on the screen over there. So lots and lots of good stuff going on. Ergonomically it is very good indeed. Now in front of me I've got a slightly quartic steering wheel, a bit like an Allegro you might want to say. Well, a curious choice, I don't know why they did that, I guess just to fit in with the general geometric angularness of the whole deal. It has many buttons which do many things but the main ones you're going to be looking at are the drive mode to flick in between Eco, Normal and Sporta. You can even set your own profile for things and of course you've got terrain mode so you can choose snow, mud, sand or just driving and normal stuff. This current screen does show that my my last drive has been 127 miles over 2 hours 15 minutes and I've averaged 2.4 miles per kilowatt hour which is a bit below what the car uh, should be able to do. Behind the wheel we have got fairly ordinary stalks for wipers and lights but behind it we have got flappy paddles on the left and the right which change our uh, regeneration mode so we can go to level zero of no regen all the way up to one pedal braking if we really want to. One little curiosity down here is we have got this interesting power button combined with a turning dial for drive, reverse, and a button on the end for park. And I've only a couple of times mistaken that dial just there for the rear wiper when I've been driving. Now this is not a car I would ordinarily be reviewing because I'm not a big SUV fan, but this is really unusual and quite interesting in the fact we've got a six-seater full-size configuration. It's like an Addison Lee uh, Alhambra, but ultra ultra luxury with masses of legroom, masses of headroom. It's unique in its place. Now one thing I haven't done in this car is a launch test. So I'm going to pop it into sport mode. Sporter. Yep, that seems to be quite a good gap. And then three, two, one. Whoa. That is... <laughs> <laughs> it's just ridiculous. This, this is something the size of a city block, firing itself at the scenery. I mean, I can't go all the way very far down this road, but hang on. Let's go one, two, three. I'm not going to tell you how fast that reached in those seconds because I was trying to back off before we hit the speed limit. Mind you, I did just use five miles of range doing that. 
One curiosity of this car is I drove it a lot in eco mode for the first few days trying to get the best range out of it. Uh, but in the end, I actually found out by accident, it seems to get better miles per kilowatt hour driving in normal mode. And I don't know why that would be. Turn off, turn off, God damn it, turn off. Turn off. Okay, I think that's off. Yeah. So zero to 60 on this thing is about five seconds. Even uphill, we are launching desperately quickly. And we already hit 60 miles an hour. And I can now tell you a bit about the ride and handling of this thing. It's got McPherson struts at the front, five link, multi-link suspension at the rear. And it is surprisingly quiet for such a big thing with what you'd imagine to be not an aerodynamic shape. Uh, it's cutting through the air virtually silently. They call that front end the digital tiger face and it must be deceptively curvy because there's no wind noise at all. And we're riding on 21 inch wheels at the moment. There's a 19 inch wheel option on the lesser versions of the car, but on this one, the GTS line, 21 is standard. So I'm now concentrating on trying to turn the lane departure off again. Thank you, because that's so annoying. And it does actually barrel around a corner. I'll barrel around a couple of corners for you. Here we go. It will throw itself around a corner. It will throw itself around a corner surprisingly well, considering it weighs 3,190 kilograms. But a lot of that weight is in the 99.8 kilowatt hour battery, which is sitting underneath the floor. And it's under my seat, in fact. So it's in the center of the car. It's a low center of mass and a central center of mass, which does help keeping the big bulk of the car pointing roughly in the right direction. Now this car is the all wheel drive version. There is a two wheel rear wheel drive version as well. And that affects two things, your range and your performance. Obviously the two wheel drive isn't quite as brisk off the line because it's not putting the traction down quite as effectively, but it does mean that instead of the claimed 313 miles combined that you get in the all wheel drive version, you actually get 349 miles combined. And it's a little tiny bit lighter as well, and you get a bigger front trunk. So a few small advantages if you go for that different version. Another claim from Kia is that it has a 2.7 kilowatt hour per mile uh, efficiency, MPG if you like. I have been running around 2.5, 2.4 most of the time. I've done a lot of motorway miles in this thing and I've been trying to drive it in eco mode and sort of 65 miles an hour to eke as much as I can out. And even then I'm not really quite hitting it on the motorway. Yesterday I drove back up to uh, Gaydon where we held the Rustable Festival uh, last weekend. And it's about a 130 odd mile drive, 260 mile round trip. And unfortunately I wound up using about 100 and 60, 170 miles of claimed estimated range in the battery in either direction. Even though this car should have been able to do the entire return journey on one full battery, I did have to recharge at the museum, but their very slow charges in three and a half hours only gave me 30 miles of range, and I had to stop somewhere else on the way home as well to, to top up. So that was a little disappointing. Obviously, I do think most EVs need to be going the opposite direction to where many of them are. They don't need to be big SUVs. They need to be small things like the new Renault 5. However, if you have a big adult family or you move adults around frequently, there's not a lot of choice. Yeah, this is... Um, this particular lane I've come down by accident because of a road closure is actually highlighting something I was going to talk about in a little while, but I'll come on to it right now. In fact, it's a good time to do that. This car is big. It's, it's five meters long. It's 1.98 meters wide. It's basically 30 centimeters shorter and two centimeters narrower than my Ford Crown Victoria. And that's a car I frequently, well, when it was not rusty, didn't use because I was gonna be going down roads where I knew it was gonna be awkward to get it in and out of a, a particular bit of traffic. This is actually about 20 centimeters longer and five centimeters wider than a Range Rover. So that gives you an idea of the, the scale of this thing. It is absolutely enormous. But unlike a lot of SUVs, and this is something I've often criticized SUVs for, and people who are SUVs lovers will shout back at me on Twitter and tell me I'm wrong. But having experienced it firsthand, I know a lot of SUVs, hands up Alfa Stelvio, um, they're enormous on the outside, but honestly, really, really pokey on the inside. 
and that's very disappointing. This though, this is enormous on the outside, but it is also enormous on the inside. The packaging on it is really, really good in that respect. In terms of money, because I'm sure you are curious about this thing, prices start for the basic 200 bhp equivalent um, rear wheel drive only air model on 19 inch wheels at £65,000. They rise up to this thing which is the 347 horsepower equivalent uh, all wheel drive highest spec GT S line which weighs in at about £77,500. So it's not budget but comparing it to things like a Range Rover which is going to hit you over hundred grand it's actually pretty good value and in terms of build quality it's a Kia so everything is really well screwed together and really it's probably not going to break because Kias just don't break that much to be fair. For the most part the uh, tactile surfaces feel quite nice they don't feel as nice in terms of buttons and things as say Mercedes G-Wagon or ML might do but they're really are not anything to be complained about. Things like the window switches, for example, do feel a little bit plasticky, whereas an ML or a G-Wagon would have nice metal switches. This car does have an insane level of technology, and admittedly, I'm not a huge fan of most of it, and some, many of the BP bongy things do just get on my nerves. There are a couple of good things, though. For example, it will recognize when there are speed cameras are around, and if you're going through an average speed check area, it will actually flash up in the head-up display, which you probably can't see on this camera, um, what your average speed has been through the speed check, which is really, really useful. So sometimes it does work. However, it's far from infallible uh, because it, as you've heard, it beeps all the time to let you know if it thinks you're going above the speed limit. It's happy to think we're doing 48 and a 60 right now. That's fine. However, on the motorway yesterday, at one point it thought a 40 mile an hour limit hadn't ended and it kept going really angry that I was doing 70 again. At one point it thought the speed limit on the motorway was 10 and it made this whole dashboard area go bright red. And another time it thought the speed limit was 80 miles an hour, which is never going to be a thing in the UK. So it's far from infallible. I do really like this thing that Kia do with the uh, indicators looking down the back of the car, though. that's a really nice touch. Another thing I'm not particularly keen on is a lane departure. I live in Kent, a lot of roads are like this and some of them are very narrow. It comes on automatically every time and it's quite aggressive and it has nearly thrown me off the road a couple of times. I've had to literally fight the steering wheel to get it back on track. Unfortunately, these are things that are not Kia. This is gonna be common on a lot of new cars, in fact, all new cars, as the mandated requirements get more and more strict and frankly annoying. So that, that's my moan out of the way. In terms of ride quality, it's fantastic. Visibility is really rather good considering it's such a big square vehicle. Uh, you generally got a good idea where the corners are, although because of the interestingly sculpted little corners of the bonnet, it's a little bit awkward. Oh, it's doing this steer, stop steering. My God, can you see it steering for me? I hate it so much. Um, because it is so slab sided, it is relatively easy to work out where you are in terms of position on the road and the cameras make it very easy to position when you're parking. It is a big car and like I found with the Crown Victoria, a lot of car parks you do find you're filling the parking space but if you were in a Range Rover or a Discovery or a Defender 110, you'd been exactly the same boat. I am very, very fond of these seats. They are not leather, as I said, they are like a, a PVC type material but they've got a lovely soft satiny feel to them which is lovely and they're perforated to let the heat and the cooling functions come through. One little surprising function of this is that the, uh, the massaging seat, if you're on the motorway for a while, it will just intermittently start up to keep you fresh. The first time it happens, it's a big surprise. The interior is a really nice place. There's loads of ambient lighting in the doors, down by your feet, and even the Kia logo, which is silver in the daytime, manages to light up in the night somehow, which is an impressive feat. Although the car is enormous, so in conclusion, is it too big for everyday use? Well, maybe it is a little bit, but is it the right size to house six fully grown adults in comfort, potentially on a long drive? Well, yes, it's also that. So it's very much a horses for courses. If you have a need for a six seater or a seven seater, there's not really much else on the market that's gonna suit you as well as this car. And as for the styling, I've spoken to more and more people as this week has gone on. 
and not one person has seen it in the metal has disliked it. Everyone has just walked up to it and gone, oh, that's, that's nice, that's interesting. And when you're driving, the fact you have got these few buttons here and the ventilation controls, and of course your seat controls down here, it does mean that it's much easier to keep your eyes on the road, even though it's flashing at me to tell me my eyes aren't on the road, because I'm talking, I don't know, than if everything was on touchscreen. The only thing that's not perfectly located is the heating and ventilation controls, which are hidden by the corner of the steering wheel most of the time, so you have to kind of look around the steering wheel. But if you go full screen on that, obviously that stops being an issue. And you can, as you can on many other EVs, switch this to driver only, so it's more power efficient to only heat this corner of the car. It turns out that despite the fact this thing is a ridiculously oversized, massive SUV that's too big and too heavy, weirdly I do kind of like it because it is, it's honest about what it's set out to do and it does that thing very well. It's when things are fit for purpose, they, they can be good. My two bugbears really are, it's a little bit thirstier than it thinks it ought to be. I admitted I've now getting 3.0 miles per kilowatt hour, which is the best I've done all week in the thing. And the lane keep assist is just way too intrusive. And it's a real pain to turn off every single time I'm stabbing this little button here on the steering wheel to keep on turning it off. If I could have the thing remapped to code out the lane keep assist, this would be the perfect big SUV. Maybe there's a setting for that in the menus, but I don't think there will be because I think it's an end cap requirement. But there you go. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this, please, as always, hit like and subscribe, bash that bell notification, head to furiousdriving.co.uk where you can find a wonderful array of lovely merchandise for sale, and join us again next time driving something completely different. Mm -hmm.